All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, certainly glad to have uh, each and every one of you here today. Um, today's message that we're going to talk about is called um, The Love of the Father and His Son. Now, this is a message that we've done before, but you know, I was looking at it and I said, this is something that really is important. And not everyone you know, on uh, the, the, our uh, service today has, um, has heard this message. And so I figured it'd be good for us to kind of go over this and really just dwell upon the, the sacrifice that God has given uh, in his son. Uh, many times when we're in this, um, you know, in this holiday season, we get caught up in the different, um, you know, activities and stuff going on, of course, made a little bit more difficult with the, um, the pandemic declaration uh, that has been um, uh, declared. But, you know, really, the, this is a, the, a good time to bring this, you know, to you know, this message, because this time really of the season is focusing upon the, the, the great sacrifice and the great salvation that we have in the Son of God. Now, I'd like to begin um, with the story of, um, of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac, and when he was called to give, you know, take his son and to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. And um, I'd like, I'm, it comes from the book of Genesis chapter 22, and I'm just going to read a verse or two from it. In verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, and go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. And so Abraham had been promised that he would be that his you know that he would be a great nation that from his line the promised messiah would come and when god said take thy son thine only son what he was talking about was that his only son of the promise because we know that abraham did have another son named ishmael but he was not talking about ishmael the promise was not given to um it was going to be fulfilled through ishmael it was going to be fulfilled through the miracle birth of Isaac. And so he tested his faith and he said, take thy son, thine only son, onto a mount that I will show you and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice. Now, think about that. If, that, if God had given you that message, many of us, we would look at that message and say, I must be hearing things. This, you know, this can't be true. And uh, I'm sure I, as you read in the uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, um, he did question. He asked the Lord again, but the Lord did not come and reiterate the, um, the command that he had given Abraham. And so what he had done in the middle of the night, he, he packed up everything and he took his son. He didn't even take the time to go and, uh, and tell Sarah what they were doing and what God had commanded. Now, it's interesting because if, God, if he had done this, he knew that his strength would probably have not been sufficient because Sarah would have bid him that he was probably hearing things and would not have wanted him to take the son. But the whole point is, is that God had said, take your son, the son of promise, and sacrifice him on the mount. Now, in today's society, you know, to take our sons, you know, to take someone that we love, or anyone for that matter, and sacrifice them was, was is really, it's barbaric. It's not even heard of. But in the time of, of uh, Abraham, this is something that the pagan um, cultures would do, is that they would sacrifice their son. So this was something that was familiar to Abraham. Abraham, knowing in his heart that this was the Lord, took his son. And he took some servants, and they took some wood, to, and, they, and they journeyed three days. And Abraham looked up in the distance, and he saw uh, the mount that God had wanted. And so he told uh, the servants, in verse 5, it says, stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants, and the boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. And so notice it says in the next verse, in verse 6, it says, so Abraham placed the wood on the burnt offering on Isaac's back. 
while he himself carried the fire and the knife as to as the two of them walked together and so of course the, you know this is you know there's you know, this pointed forward to the sacrifice that Christ was going to happen you notice that Abraham had put the um, the wood on the back of the sacrifice on Isaac in the same way Christ would take and care and bear his cross up to Mount Calvary and in the next verse in verse 7 Isaac recognizing that something was missing. And you can imagine that, that Abraham, the, the burden of this command of God, he had told no one. And Isaac recognizing that they, had, they do not have a lamb for the sacrifice. And in verse 7, Isaac said, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep? For the burnt offering, where is the lamb? And oh, it must have, must have just burned within the heart of Abraham that he would tell his son what God had, had uh, commanded him. But this was not to be yet. He held on and didn't tell him. And he said, "God will provide us a lamb for a burnt offering." And so they journeyed up to the, um, to the top of the mountain. They set up an altar, and then he told his son. He says, "Son." God has commanded that you would be the sacrifice. Now you can imagine how this must have broke Abraham's heart because when you, when you think about this son that he loved so very much, and he was his only son that was with him at the time. And to tell him that he would be this sacrifice. Now I think Abraham was up in years, he was probably what, well over 100 years old, probably about 117, 120 years old at this time. And, um, you know, so he was an old man, but um, Isaac was a young man. And if Isaac didn't want to be sacrificed, he could easily have overcome his father and left. But when he had told him, um, Isaac submitted himself to his father, to the will of God, to become a sacrifice. And so Abraham brings Isaac and he bound, binds him up, puts him on the altar, and he takes the knife that he is going to slay, the, uh, slay him with. And you can imagine that Satan must have been speaking to him, yelling at him, and impressing upon him, said, this can't be from God. How would, why would God do this? And he must have had doubts in his mind. And, but he was re resolved in following the will of God. Previously, he had lost faith in the promise of God. And, he's, and he, he, he vowed that he would do what God had asked him to do. And he didn't know if, if he would kill him or if he would raise Isaac back up, but he left it to the Lord. And so with tears in his eyes, he took that knife and he raised it as he was going to, to slay Isaac. And, and just as he was about to thrust the knife down, he hears the voice of the Lord. And I like it in the, um, in the King James Version. It says, um, and uh, in verse 11, in verse 10, it says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the, the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from thee. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And so when you think about this story, you think about the, um, you know, how this must have really just wrung the heart of Abraham. And then the joy that he had in his heart when he was commanded to stop. And that the Lord knew that, uh, knew that he feared the Lord. And so when we think about this, uh, this story, um, we think about a father and a son and, and the, the love that a father has for their son. And we get an idea of just how much um, of a sacrifice it was for God to send his son his only begotten son to, 
to not just to die for our sins, but to become a man and to live a life of toil and strife and to be, and to be eventually sacrificed for the salvation of man. So when we think about Christ coming the first time, we think about the plan of salvation and what God had done in sending his son. In the plan of salvation is demonstrated the infinite love that God has for each and every one of us. God giving his son to die for us was the greatest gift that could be given for us. And so we have um, in the, the Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, uh, Ellen White writes this. She says, the greatest gift that God could bestow upon men was bestowed in the gift of his beloved son. What was it about the gift of his son that makes it the most important, the most precious gift that could be given to us? So when we think about the story of Abraham, we offering up his son gives us a better understanding of the great sacrifice that God uh, gave in giving his son. But why is the gift of his son the greatest gift? And that's the question that we're going to, to answer here today. Why not his own life? You know, we think about, you know, how um, he sent his son, but why didn't he give his life? Why couldn't, couldn't God sacrifice himself? And I think that when we go through our study today, we'll find out that he did sacrifice himself, and he did so in his son. But to better understand, we have to look back at what was lost. So in the beginning, God created uh, God. In the beginning, God created man a holy, uh, with a holy nature. In fact, we were created in the very image of God. In Genesis chapter one, verses um, twenty-six and twenty-seven, uh, it reads, "And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and of the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the, all the earth." and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We were created to bear his likeness physically, spiritually, but a lot of times they don't, you know, people don't realize is that we were to bear his image relationally as well. We find in Genesis chapter 131, it says, And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. If you notice that at the completion of each day of creation, it says, and God saw that it was good. But at the end of the sixth day, he saw, says that it was very good. So everything that he had created before this was good. The first day, the second day, everything he saw was good. But on the end of the uh, of the Sixth day, when man was created in the image of God, he said it is very good. The life that man had in the garden was a perfect and holy life without spot and blemish. When our parents sinned, they had lost this perfect and uh, their perfect holy characters. They were no longer without spot and wrinkle. They were not, um, in the beginning, man was created in the image of God but now was tainted with sin, he could no longer reflect the perfect image of God. And I want you to notice something here, because they were, when they were created, they were created perfect, without blemish, without spot. They were in the very image of God, not just physically, not just spiritually, but also relationally, okay? So um, we notice in Genesis chapter 5, verse, verse 3, it says, and Adam lived 130 years. So he was 130 years old. And it says, and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. So Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. And if they would have had a son before all of this sin, then this son would have taken on the very um, image of God without the blemish of sin. But that was not so. Because they had sinned, that had did not happen. So when they brought forth a son after sin. Notice he said, and begat a son in his own likeness after his own image. No longer did, Abraham, did Adam have a perfect and upright character. He could only give to his posterity that which he had, and that was an imperfect life. So I'd like, to, um, uh, like you to notice, I'm going to share my screen. Um, 
what the, uh, the book Patriarchs and Prophets says about the sorrow that fell upon heaven when man had sinned. Notice it says, the fall of man filled all heaven with sorrow. The world that God had made was blighted with the curse of sin and inhabited by beings doomed to misery and death. There appeared no escape for those who had transgressed the law. Angels ceased their songs of praise. Throughout the heavenly courts, there was mourning for the ruin that sin had wrought. So we see here that the plan of redemption was revealed to the heavenly host that offered themselves to be a sacrifice for man. So they were sorrowful, and when God had presented to them the, the plan of salvation, they desired to take the place of Jesus in giving themselves as a sacrifice. So we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, again, page 63, it says, the angels prostrated themselves at the feet of their commander and offered to become a sacrifice for man. But notice what she says, but an angel's life could not pay the debt. Only he who created man had power to redeem him. In the great plan of redemption, two things needed to be accomplished. Two things needed to be accomplished. First, the law of God must be satisfied. And second, man must be restored back into the image of God. We find in the book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. And so another way of saying this verse, the wages of sin is death, is the result or the consequence of the sin is death. But then it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16, which we read in our uh, opening text, for God so loved the world that he gave, notice that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So when Adam had sinned, no longer did he have everlasting life. But God, in sending his son, sent his son that they may have everlasting life once again. It was only through the gift of his son, and we need to, this is a very important thing. It was only through the gift of his son that um, man could be saved. I mean, that is the whole foundation of the gospel, is that God gave his son for the salvation of man. So we're going to read a little bit more from Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, what it says, it says, the Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the following race. His heart was moved with infinite passion, compassion, as the woes of the lost world rose before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. The broken law of God redeemed the life of the sinner. Notice it says, in all the universe, there was but one, notice, one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgressions. Again, she re reiterates and says, none but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the father and his son. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to, re to rescue the ruined race. Now I'd like to, for us to notice that when it says the Son of God, God's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race, we need to understand here is that his divinity was the one that was mourning for, and with pity for the fallen race. And what this means is that the Father himself also, in the same way, was touched with pity for the fallen race. The Son of God was the only being, the only being, that could, um, that could redeem fallen man. Why not the life of a holy angel? I mean, isn't, it th isn't that what the law required, that a holy being could be sacrificed? Now, it goes far beyond what the law says. It was the, the, the real problem that man has was not just that he had sinned, but he, his life was now corrupted with sin, and he needed a life 
uh, outside of himself that he could be saved. Because the angel, though they were holy, only had conditional immortality. Their life was insufficient to pay the price for sin. Only a divine life, a life that is unborrowed, a life that is equal with God himself, could satisfy the claims of the law. So my friends, the true source of life is God the Father. His life is the only life that is without beginning and without end. And so we find in um, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, B, page 104, it says this, Immortality is an attribute of God alone. 1 Timothy 6.16 who, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And so we find here is that only God has immortality. Psalm chapter 90, verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or even the, uh, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. My friends, the source of all life is God. Because he is the source of all life, he could not offer his life. If the source of all life were to die or to become dormant or inactive, all life would cease. Therefore, God could not give his life. He could only give the life of his son, who had a divine life, and that life was not borrowed. He had, he had life unto himself. But the difference between the father and the son is that the son is not the source of all life. The source of all life is the father. Only the son of God could the demands, or only in the son of God could the demands of the law be met. And so we find that throughout the scriptures, the spirit of prophecy, Jesus is re referred to as the Son of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And we notice that in order for God to save humanity, <clears throat> he, had, he needed a life that was equal with his own. He did this through the gift of his only begotten Son. So my friends, what is the requirement to be the only begotten son of God. By its very meaning, begotten means to be, to give birth or to come forth from. And to be born infers that there is a beginning. So was Christ born? Well, many times you hear people say that no, Christ couldn't be born because to be born means that you have a beginning. And because, because the Son of God is God himself, God has no beginning. And that's the, the rationale that is used to, um, um, you know, to, you know, when it comes to Christ being the Son of God. But the Bible, throughout the Bible, is very clear that he is the only begotten, the only born. Therefore, he was born. But to be born of God, to be divine, did not require him to have always have existed because he came forth from the very bosom of the Father. And so many times people don't realize, but the Bible also gives us information about the birth of the Son, about the birth of Jesus Christ. So we find in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. And so I'm going to ask, um, let's ask uh, Sister Marie, who's joining us from Hawaii, if you can read the Eight. verses, the verses. Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm, not Psalms, Proverbs 8, 22 to 25. Proverbs 8, 22 to 25. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before he, his works of old. I have been established from everlasting from the beginning before there were ever on earth and an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills I was brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the prim primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he straightened the, the fountains of the deep. How far? Uh, through 25. Oh, I'm sorry. 
That's <laughs> okay. You know, you can go through verse 30, it's fine. Okay. When he assigned the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, when I was beside him as a master craftsman, and when I was, I was daily his delight. Thank you. So we find here in Proverbs chapter 8. Now, the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon, you know, the one that God had given such great wisdom to. And in fact, there was no one so wise as, uh, as Solomon. So the book of Proverbs was written before he had fallen into sin, before he had took upon himself many wives from the, from the surrounding nations. And so his, um, his intellect, his connection with God was, you know, was evident in this here because he was talking about wisdom and he's talking about Christ being the wisdom of God because it says the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. And so this is talking about a time before anything was created. And, and it says uh, in verse 24, when there was no depth, I was brought forth. Okay. So this is talking about him being brought forth from the father. And in verse 25, it says, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. So two times here in the book of Proverbs chapter 8, it's, a, it's talking about being brought forth. And this is talking about Christ's birth, but in the form of wisdom. And many times people say, oh, this is not talking about Christ. This is talking about wisdom. But we find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 through 30. It says in verse or 24 and 30, it says in verse 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and calls him the wisdom of God. And then further on in verse 30, it says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is, who, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so Christ is uh, talked about here as the wisdom of God. But you want to notice something here. It's not just the Bible that says that, but the prophet of God also in the books, Patri book Patriarchs and Prophets also brings forth this, um, this truth. So let me share once again, and we're going to read, uh, we're going to read um, Patriarchs and Prophets, um, page, 30, page 34. Notice what it says. It says, the sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate, all, appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Notice this. Christ the Word the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose. The only being that could enter into the, to all the counsels and purposes of God. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, verse 6. His goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, Micah 5, 2. And the Son of God declares, notice this, the Son of God declares concerning himself, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. When he appointed the fountains of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his del delight, rejoicing always before him. Quoting here, Proverbs 8, 22 through 30. So Christ, the Son of God, is literally the Son of God because he says, I was brought forth from the Father. He is, not, uh, he is not the Son of God like heavenly beings who were created. He was not created. He is not the Son of God like we are through adoption. He is the Son of God because he was brought forth from the Father, from the very essence of who God is, from, very, from divinity. He was brought forth from the divine being of God, and therefore he is equal with God because he is the same nature as God. He is the same as God. God gave himself his life, unto, God gave him life unto himself. And notice this, 
Jesus declares of himself in, um, in Matthew eleven twenty seven. Matthew eleven twenty seven says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father gave the Son, and he to whoever the Son will reveal him. My friends, the life that Jesus has in heaven and on earth is an eternal life. Not as the life that we have, but an everlasting life. Notice in, um, in our next text, or our next uh, quote from the Selected Messages, book one, page 296, it says, in him was life. Talking about the Son of God. In him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. And a lot of times we, we, we um, people forget this uh, fact that this everlasting life that God promises to us can only be possessed through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given him as a free gift. If he will be, believe in Christ as his personal Savior, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But notice, if you will, in, um, and turn to the book of John, chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. Now, no, um, I'd like uh, Kathy or J.D., either one, if you could uh, read John, chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. John 5, 26 and 27. One sec. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 1. John chapter 5, 26 and 27. Right. Um, one moment, I'm bringing it up. No worries. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he hath given him authority to ex execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Thank you for that, sister. But, you know, the thing here is, is that the Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 5, 26 is telling us is that for as the Father has life in himself, so the source of all life comes from the Father. And as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. So how is it that the Son of God was given life? Well, in the same way that we give life to our children, he was born, he came forth from the Father. And that is how he has life. But not just life, but he has authority because he is from God. He was sent, he was brought forth, and he was sent to us. The demands of the law required the life of the sinner because we know that the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death. Um, and in order for the sinner to be freed from sin, freed from this um, this. Uh, sentence of death. It says it, it required a life that was greater than the life of the created being. Not even the life of the holy angels was sufficient. It required a divine life. My friends, you know, the, our very nature is sinful. We sin because we, uh, we sin by nature. We do the things that are, that, uh, that are um, against the will of God because it is in our nature to do so. In the same way that dogs bark, it's because it is in their nature to do so. It is in our nature to sin. Not because God created us to sin, but because Adam and Eve had chosen to sin, their natures had been corrupted. And what was required was a life that was not only everlasting, but a life that was holy and righteous and good, one that was inherently holy, righteous, and good, one that was inherently everlasting. Um, but how can, but how is it that divinity, which cannot die, pay the price for our sins? So it required a divine life, but how is it that a divine life, which cannot die, pay the price for our sins? Well, we find in um, the Spirit of Prophecy, page, um, or volume three, page 77, it says this, it says, Christ in taking the nature of man was divinity clothed in 
humanity. And so divinity had to take upon itself humanity. But notice this other text or this other uh, quote from the Upward Look, page 260. This is what it says. Was the human nature of the Son of Mary changed into the divine nature of the Son of God? Notice that. That's the question. Was the divine, was the human nature of the Son of God, uh, the Son of Man, changed into the divine nature of the Son of God? The answer is no. Notice this. The two natures were mysteriously blended in one person. Now, that's why you know, it is mysterious how God became, how Christ divine became a man. And even here it says it's mysterious. The man Christ Jesus, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Notice that. Deity did not sink and die. That would have been impossible. So the divine nature of God in Christ could not die, but it was joined together and blended as one person. And because of that, the human nature was the one that died. The two natures were so mysteriously blended together that the divinity of Christ lay in the tomb with humanity. So when Christ lay in the tomb, his divinity did not die, but it became inactive. It became dormant. It was unconscious. You remember how Jesus said uh, of death, he said, um, our, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, okay? So when Lazarus was dead, he actually, Christ called it a sleep because the disciples who had, um, the disciples who had um, said, oh, if he sleeps, he's going to get better. And so Christ clarified and he says, no, our friend Lazarus has died. And so he equates sleep with death. And so what it's talking about here is when, when Christ went into the grave, his humanity died. His, you know, the, the, the human part of him died, but the divinity continued to live, albeit it was dormant, inactive, as if it was dead, right? Notice what um, she goes on, to, or what is written in the, um, in the Bible, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1150. It says this, The Spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did not wing its way to heaven, there to maintain a separate existence and to look down upon the mourning disciples, embalming the body from which it had taken flight. All that, notice this, this is really important, all that compromise or comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with him, with his body in the sepulcher. And when he came forth, it was as a whole being. So Christ did not go, his, his, uh, his divine nature, his divine spirit did not wing its way to heaven. It lay dormant in the grave. His humanity or his divinity was united with his uh, humanity. Remember, when Christ became a man, he laid, he laid aside the three attributes of divinity, the divinity of all power, all knowing, and also omnipresence, the ability to be everywhere at once. He laid these aside, but what he did not lay aside was his divine nature. He took with him his divine nature, and God united it with his human nature that came from Mary. So the question that we have to ask is, could Christ have sinned? Was it possible for him to sin? And so the answer is, of course he could have sinned. In his human nature, he could have sinned. And if he would have sinned in his human nature, his divinity would have laid dormant in the grave for all eternity. So when we think about the great sacrifice that God had given in his son, it meant that there was the possibility that his son could have sinned in his human nature, and by that, his, divine, his divinity would lay dormant for all eternity. That is the great sacrifice. We notice in James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God 
cannot be tempted with evil, neither he tempteth any man. But my friends, God, Christ clothed in uh, humanity could have sinned. Because if Christ could have, could have sinned, could not have sinned, what good would that have done for you and me? He could have sinned. So what would happen, notice, and I've already said this, but I want to back this up with a text from Manuscript Script Releases, volume 10, page 385. It says this. The Spirit, oh, no, no, that's not the one. To the honor and glory of God, his beloved Son, the surety, the substitute, was delivered up and descended into the prison house of the grave. Now, of course, this prison house of the grave is metaphoric. It says the, the, the new tomb enclosed him in its rocky chambers. Notice what Ellen White writes. If one single sin had tainted his character, notice this talking about his character says, the stone would never have been rolled away from the door of his rocky chamber, and the world would, uh, and the world with its burden of guilt would have perished. My friends, Christ risked his eternal existence for you and me. If he had sinned in any way, he would never have been raised from the tomb. Though he was divine, he was also human. His divinity would have slept in the grave for all eternity. Another quote from the G.C. Bulletin, uh, December 1, 1895, says this. Remember that Christ risked all, tempted like as we are. He staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. Heaven itself was imperiled for our redemption. Many times we don't recognize the fact that in God sending his son, that all of heaven was imperiled. Can you imagine the weight that was on Jesus, the son of God, when he came and be a, to be a man? Feeling the, the, the power of, his, of sin that had upon his, his human nature. I don't think we realize the magnitude um, of this statement. Not only did Christ in giving, uh, giving his life for us risk his own existence, but God in giving his son imperiled all of heaven. He gave all that he could give for our salvation. Since the life of Christ was the very life of God, God uh, given to Jesus as an inheritance. Notice that. The very life that God had given to his son was an inheritance. Only the son of God could atone for our sins. The life of God the Father could not be given because he is the source of all life. His life was not given to him. He has always possessed it. He is the one true eternal God. Because God the Father could not give his life, he gave us his life through his son. The Son, in turn, could offer up his divine life because it was given to him. This was not an easy thing to do. This was not easy for God to let go and just say, I'm going to give my Son. I want you, there's another text um, in the um, Patriarchs and Prophets that kind of gives us an idea of the struggle that the Father had in giving his Son. Notice it says, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth. And so this plan has always been in existence. For Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, according to Revelation 13, verse 8. But notice this. She says, yet it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. But notice, she says, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a, what a beautiful thing it is that God himself struggled, but because of his love for us, his love for us overcame that which, um, you know, his struggle. John 17, um, verses 21 through 23 so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my brother Romy, if you will, 
um, to unmute yourself and read John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. John 17, 21 through 23. John 17. That they all may be one. Yeah, you're good. You're good. I can hear you. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me. And I in that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Amen, my brother. Thank you for reading that. Father, I... Amen. So as we are united with Christ, when we think about this great gift that God has given us in his son, as we are united with Christ, from this very verse, we are united with God. And notice this. This is a really important thing. It, it just tells us just how much we had been given in the plan of salvation, in the gift of God. It says, for of all the created beings, God has given them life. The angels, he gave them a holy, a righteous life. All the other created beings, he gave a holy and a righteous life. But only with man, by redemption of fallen man, he gives us his life. There is a difference. Because if the life of a holy angel could not be given, then that means that, uh, that the divine life that God gives to us is his own very life. That is why we have, have power to become children of God, not just adopted children, not just declared children, not just children um, like, it, it, it's so much greater. We become literally children of God because we have the very life of God given to us through his son. And so I'd just like to summarize what we have been studying here today in this last um, slide. It says, Our atonement required a divine and eternal life. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, was the only being that could ransom man, that could lift him up and save him. The reason why Jesus could lay his life down we, was because it was given unto him. He inherited that from his father. The father could not lay his life down because he was, um, he was the source of all things. Jesus' divinity slept in the grave with his body. The Son of God risked his very existence to save you and me. In giving us his Son, God put uh, in peril heaven itself. God gave all that he that could be given that we could be saved. My friends, that is the beauty and the wonderful gift that God has given us. He has given us all of heaven because Christ is the wisdom of God. He is the power of God. He is how God relates or, or shares and speaks and, and reveals himself to all of creation is through his son. Because if you notice something here, he is the word of God. And we think about that and we don't really understand that that means is that he is how God communicates with all of the other creative beings. God is so holy and he is enveloped in this, in light that he, um, he, he needed to have a son in order for the world, for all of the, the angels and the intelligent worlds and even man could um, could come into communion with him. If Christ had not been victorious, if Christ had been overcome, all of heaven would have been in peril. And so when we look upon ourselves and we think about, our, you know, about the six circumstances that we are in, we need to keep this one thing in mind, is that we are precious before the Lord. That God has paid an infinite cost that we could be saved. 
So when we look upon those that are in the world that we think are too fallen, that God can't reach them, that God can't save them. Because not only did God give his life for us, he gave his life for everyone else. And my friends, that really is the, the beauty of our salvation. When we sang that song, um, the, our opening song, and it said that, you know, you know, in the heart of Jesus, and it talked about that the work of redemption that was, was a work that the angels desired to do, that they would love to have been the ones to give themselves for us. They would love to have been the ones to be ministers unto us to, to, to bring the word of salvation. You remember in, um, in, in the, the Christmas story where the shepherds were on the, the hill and, he, and, and uh, they were contemplating, thinking about the coming Messiah. And the angels um, saw that, and they, they gave the, the tidings of great joy. It says, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. And, you know, talking about the Son of God that was born and became a man. And so we need to understand that this gift that we have is so very precious. It's not, it's not just that Jesus gave his life. That the Father, God himself, the source of all things, gave life. He gave us this redemption through his Son. And so that's the beauty of what we have been studying here today, is that we are of a such infinite value to God. God struggled with this, but love for us, um, because of his love, love won out, and he consented to give his Son. So my friends, that's really um, our, um, our message today. I think it is worth um, looking at from time to time and just to understand that in giving us his son, he has given us everything. If there was something more he could give, he would have given it. And so because of that, what is our response to him? Our response should be adoration and praise and surrendering our hearts to him and reaching out to give this good news, this good, this gospel that Christ, that God has given us his son, that we could be restored back into communion with him, that where he is, we may, we may be also, all right? So we're going to, uh, to move and to, um, um, we're going to sing our um, closing hymn, and after that, we'll open it up and we'll have a uh, discussion. Our, the, our song is uh, that we're going to sing is I Will Sing of Jesus' Love.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, what a, what a wonderful blessing we've received here today, Father, to study and to look at the great sacrifice that you had made in giving us your Son. Father, we, our hearts are filled with joy today that you have accomplished this work, Father, and that your work, you're, you're completing the work of sanctifying us and preparing us to be with you once again. So, Father, as we leave here today, Father, we, we leave, to, leave uh, not to be away from you, but that we invite your presence to continue to be with us in every step of the way, every day that we, that we live until you come again. So, Father, we know that the time is short. We know that the things that are going on in this world are building up to a crescendo, building up to a point to where the whole world will be convicted. The whole world will, will be brought the good news of salvation, and each will make a decision one way or the other. Father, our prayer is, is that you will lead us and guide us and, and uh, give us your spirit that we may reach out to seek and to save the lost, uh, the lost Father. That the work of salvation, the work of bringing the good news to the world, Father, could have been given to the angels, but you have given us the, the privilege and the honor of sharing this wonderful news with those who are like ourselves, Father, that are human, that are prone to death, Father, that are overcome with sin, that we can bring this good news that there is a way of escape, that there is eternal life in receiving the only begotten, the literal Son of God, that we may be um, receive the life of God and be united with Him once again. So we claim these promises and we thank you for all of these blessings. We ask that you bless us and keep us. I pray this in the name and the wonderful name, the lovely name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.